When you're picking out an oscilloscope, one of the first numbers that hit you in the head is bandwidth. The bandwidth of an oscilloscope tells you how much signal content that it can measure. But what does that mean? For example, this scope is measuring the same signal on each channel, yet the waveform looks different on each. The reason is they have different bandwidths. For another comparison, look at how bandwidth affects the rise time of this signal. In this episode, we talk about what bandwidth is, what it isn't, sample rate, and two measurements that you can use to check to see if you're being band limited. With that, let's go measure. To be upfront, Roden Schwartz gave me this RTH scope writer and asked us to make a video with it. And as usual, I got to pick the topic. It is a full featured bench scope in a compact package. But the main reason I want to use it is because it has these built in filters, which allows us to simulate a bunch of different bandwidths without having to have a whole bunch of scopes in the lab. If you're interested in the RTH 1000, there is a link to the Element 14 community with more information. Using this scope as an example, it has up to 500 megahertz of bandwidth with sample rates as high as five giga samples per second. One mistake I've noticed people make is that they confuse bandwidth and sample rate. For example, I have actually heard people call this a five gigahertz oscilloscope because its sample rate is five giga samples per second. Notice that I'm using two different words. And the reason is that bandwidth is analog and sample rate is digital. Right behind the B and C connector, there is an attenuator stage, which also buffers the signal for the analog to digital converter. Like any amplifier, that buffer has a frequency response, which for oscilloscopes looks like a low pass filter. That shape means it passes most of the signal content from DC or zero Hertz to wherever the attenuation drops by three decibels. That's where the bandwidth spec comes from. The analog signal passing through that stage goes into an analog to digital converter, which samples the data and that's where the sample rate comes from. We know from the combined work of Nyquist and Shannon that you need to sample data at least two times faster than the fastest signal content. Now notice I did say at least. Some people forget that the sampling has to be faster than two times. Keep in mind that oscilloscopes will change their sample rate depending on factors like the number of active channels, time-based settings, and the amount of acquisition memory available. Most oscilloscopes that you buy today have enough sample rate that they're going to be doing oversampling by a factor of three, five, or even 10. Because of that, I just wanna make the point one more time, don't confuse sample rate and bandwidth. Bandwidth is probably going to be more important to determine what kind of signals your scope can look at. One reason bandwidth is a difficult spec to consider is because the amount you need depends entirely on the type of signal you are looking at. For example, using an arbitrary waveform generator, let's compare the difference of a one megahertz sine and square wave, each with a voltage of one volt peak to peak. On the RTH oscilloscope, both channels have their bandwidth limited to one megahertz. The green channel is supposed to be a square wave, but it doesn't look very square now, does it? There's also another issue, but we're gonna come back to that in a minute. Why do those both look like sine waves? That is because of math and harmonics. Sine waves are a fundamental wave shape and they make up everything else by adding multiple frequencies together. Since square waves are made up of multiple frequencies, we need to increase the bandwidth to something like five megahertz in order to see the actual square shape. To really point out how there are multiple frequencies, let's go into the frequency domain with an FFT. Now the scope screen is showing frequency across the X and magnitude along the Y. For the square wave we're putting in, we can see that there is a peak at the one megahertz carrier and harmonics at three and five megahertz. That's what I mean when I say that it takes multiple sine waves to make up a single square wave. Now, let's go back to the time domain to see another problem that I mentioned. Remember, the ARB is outputting one volt peak to peak, but we are only measuring about 700 millivolts peak to peak on the sine wave channel. And to answer why that is, we have to go back to the response curve I showed earlier. Remember, a bandwidth gets defined where a filter, or in this case, oscilloscope, attenuates the signal by 3 dB, which works out to be about a 30% reduction in voltage. Now, by increasing the bandwidth on the sine waves channel to five megahertz, the wave shape doesn't change, but it gets larger, and now we measure the correct one volt peak to peak. I really like these basic examples. They really show why answering how much bandwidth do I need becomes so complicated. 
You know, for RF or radio frequency signals, you just need enough bandwidth to keep the signal in your test and the flat portion of the bandwidth response. And for digital signals, that's why there's this guideline out there that says you need three to five times higher than the frequency of the digital signal. The idea is to capture all of the harmonics. But... Now that I've given you a guideline on how to pick bandwidth, here's a little bit of an exception when measuring slow digital signals. For this setup, an Arduino Uno toggles a pin at about one kilohertz. Based on what I said in the last section, we should take one kilohertz times five to set a bandwidth limit of five kilohertz. Hey, wait a second. Why did the signal change so much? The subtle key lies in what happens when multiple sine waves get added together. It makes the waveform edge sharper. And so while in this case, the fundamental signal is only one kilohertz, the edge rate is determined by how fast the microcontroller turns the pin on, meaning it could contain more frequencies than three or five kilohertz. Using a rise time measurement, it appears that this edge takes 78 microseconds to go from zero to one. Now, at this point, I'm going to do a little bit of hand waving. Well, more than usual. Dividing 0.35 by the rise time gives us the edge's bandwidth, which comes out to be about 4.4 kilohertz. And I know you're going to ask, why 0.35? That value depends on the filter response and can vary by scope or filter circuit. Now for scopes, some manufacturers will actually state the factor in their data sheets, but not all of them and not for all models. So why am I bothering with all of this? Well, because that 4.4 kilohertz number is a little bit of a lie when I say it's the bandwidth of our signal. It's actually the bandwidth of our measurement. 4.4 kilohertz and 5 kilohertz are pretty close to each other, which means we're measuring a rise time near the fastest rise time that our scope, or in this case filter, can measure, which means we're hitting our bandwidth limit. When the filters are turned off, the rise time for this signal is now about three nanoseconds, not 78 microseconds. And if we do that same calculation as before, we can see this signal has about 116 megahertz of content, which means the 500 megahertz scope should have enough bandwidth to accurately reproduce it. Now, usually you don't need to do this math because most oscilloscope data sheets specify their front end with both bandwidth and fastest rise time they can measure. And just a note, if you're just trying to debug a slow digital circuit or serial signal or something, capturing the sharp edges usually doesn't matter. You really only need to make sure that you have enough bandwidth for both the fundamental and the third harmonic. However, if you wanna do any kind of characterization, that's where accuracy does matter. And in that case, you do need to watch parameters like the amplitude or the rise time to see if your measurement is getting band limited. Before I close, here's some quick advice on picking a scope's bandwidth. If you were looking at RF or sine waves, it's pretty easy, just go slightly higher than your fastest frequency. For complex or digital waveforms, the three to five times the fundamental is usually good enough, but keep an eye on those rise times. Even though modern CMOS circuits like the chips used in an Arduino have a relatively fast edge, 10 megahertz will be enough to at least let you see wiggles, while 50 to 70 megahertz is likely enough for most debug, and then 100 to 500 megahertz is going to allow you to do really good characterization. Also know that most modern oscilloscopes can also be upgraded if you find yourself hitting a brick wall. If you still need some help understanding bandwidth or how much you might need for a measurement, post a message over on the Element 14 community. Either I or another member can help answer it. While you are there, you can find show notes with links to the RTH oscilloscope. As always, thank you for watching. For now, it is time for me to get back to digitizing samples with the power of 10 on my electronics workbench.